as we know, as I'm sure all of you know, um, uh, there, there is an epidemic of, um, of lifestyle-related um, diseases among Aboriginal Australians, um, most people today, and it, it, it's a worse epidemic than what we have ourselves in the broader, com in the, in the broader community. So um, it, it, it's a um, very high prevalence of low birth weight and, um, high, and high prevalence of smoking, poor quality diet, um, low in fresh foods uh, in remote parts of the country in particular, but, but it, is a, it, it is a result of, of an of a, of a underprivileged population in many ways. Many people are, in remote parts of the country live on, on welfare, and it's actually, if you don't hunt and gather, it's actually very hard to, to afford a healthy diet. So high in sugar, fat and salt, um, um, relative, and, and then people, when people do get fat, they tend to have a central pattern of fat distribution in both men and women, um, and um, therefore, and that is a, a risk pattern, and very high prevalence of diabetes, early age of onset, um, it happens often in teenage years or even younger in some circumstances. <coughs> Lots of gestational <laughs> diabetes, um, and, um, and really a very high prevalence of, um, of cardiovascular disease and kidney failure. And these also occur early in, in life. Uh, and I just want to talk briefly about um, a, a, a very healthy community I went to in, um, in Arnhem Land in 1985, and I'll, 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 it's not the earliest study I'm going to talk about, but these people actually had, uh, they were the, they're the only group that I've ever worked with that had a healthy red cell folate, and that was pretty much from bush food. So, uh, but they were very, very lean, and, um, and really uh, the, the, the BMI in this group, the highest, was 19.3, and he, young girl who actually looked almost fat in that population. But, uh, so people were healthy, but they were very, very lean. And this shows the body habitats, I think, extremely well. And in the old days, when people hunted and, and, uh, and gathered, it was hard work. And if you, even if you lived on the coast, you didn't have, have motorboats in those days. So people actually um, were, you know, had fantastic body builds and terrifically health and were very healthy. Sorry, I've got to get, oh God, what am I doing? Yes, the therapeutic potential then of the hunter-gatherer lifestyle is something that I've been interested in for many years and I'm going to go quickly through a, the results of a study that I did in 1982 and then obviously of much more recent ones. This was done in the Kimberley, in, in, um, in this part of the Kimberley in northwestern Australia. Um, and we spent some time, quite a bit of time travelling, which I won't go into, uh, but uh, then two weeks on the coast and then three weeks on a river inland. And so had very different types of diet at that time. So um, tests were done before and after the seven-week study, um, 10 days travelling, um, and then uh, the diet almost entirely from seafood on the coast, and then, then a diet that was much more general, animals, reptiles, birds, freshwater, fish, yams and figs, um, and really uh, it was comprised of, of few, few foods made up most of the diet, and I think this is an interesting point too, and it's a seasonal issue of course as well. So we, um, people were weighed during the study as well as at the baseline and follow-up, weighed regularly, um, and what we found was that there was weight loss of about, it was very steady weight loss, and that's what I wanted to see, how, how regular that was. And so people lost just over about a kilogram a, a week um, in this study. Um, fasting glucose fell very dramatically um, in these people who, are, who were diabetic. Um, and uh, their insulin also fell, which was very important. Um, blood pressure as well. and um, bleeding time increased and it increased on the seafood diet which we were expecting but it continued to increase inland as, as well so eating a, a, a diet which was much more mixed um, uh, was and, uh, and very high in omega-3 fatty acids and I'll, I'll talk about the sources of that in a moment. Um, so the composition of the diet and this is interesting talking about feeling hungry 
um, uh, 1,200 calories per person per day. For a two-week period, I weighed and um, documented all of the food that was, that was caught and consumed and took samples back in a liquid nitrogen container to analyse when I got back to Melbourne. Um, so it was very high in protein, and I'm not saying that's absolutely typical. It was typical of these people in that part of the country at that time of the year. A third of the energy from carbohydrate and just 13% energy is fat. And I'll, as I'll make a point a bit later, uh, the favourite foods were f fat and, and honey. So, and yet they didn't get, you know, they were favoured foods, but they didn't get that much of it. So, um, and, the, uh, and the fat itself was, was um, sorry, I keep doing that, uh, was, was mixed, you know, saturated, um, monounsaturated and polyunsaturated, and the, but the polyunsaturated was very, was a, a, a ratio of omega-3 or in, in 6 to N3 fatty acids of one of about one, equal amounts. And that's really a very, very healthy fat mix. Whereas um, in our diet, uh, which we'll talk about a bit later, we, um, we have a, a much higher ratio of N6 to, to N3, much lower amount of, of omega-3 fats. So what drove the striking improvements in, uh, in health? I mean, I've, I've said high protein, it was a bulky diet. But the high protein, I think, was very important in people not feeling hungry, even though they weren't eating um, a huge amount. Uh, regular physical activity, we had to, had to be active every day or you didn't eat. Um, low energy intake, as I've said, uh, was, of course, probably one of the most important factors. And uh, you wouldn't recognise me, but it was 35 years ago. Uh, and, uh, but we, we spent a lot of time talking about what people would do when they went back to Mohanjum, how they would, because they felt fantastic and uh, they really did recognise and they were, you know, uh, they didn't need convincing that this was a healthy lifestyle. Um, it was an omnivorous diet that was derived from a wide range of animal and plant foods. And the composition, and I'm talking generally now around Australia, the, the, the composition was greatly influenced by where they were. And I'll be talking about that towards the end of my presentation, that more, m most Aboriginal people at White Settlement lived where we now live. They lived in the south, the rich southeast, south and eastern part of, of the country. Um, and so their diet and lifestyle was probably very different from the one I'm talking about here, or not very different, but, but significantly different. Um, so, um, and, and it does vary a, a, over geographical regions. Physical activity was built into daily routines, of course, because you don't survive otherwise. Walking long distances, digging for yams, reptiles, eggs, honey, chopping down trees for honey chopping branches, winnowing and grinding of seeds, as used to happen in the southeast parts of the country, much more than it happens necessarily in the northern parts, um, uh, and digging pits for baking large animals, and um, gathering wood for fires, for cooking, and for, for warmth, which was when you weren't, when you, you didn't have to go far from the coast for the nights to get very, very cold. And land management. When first settlers arrived, um, this, the, the, um, the land wasn't, the, the operation of the land, the management of the land wasn't considered um, agriculture per se. And I guess there was a vested interest in that. But, but in fact, the more we know about it now is it was a very, um, very careful way of, of, of management. People, people would lead, take yams to distant islands and that would then be a food source if they got stranded other, at, at other times. Um, they they um, would would they would um, f spit the seeds out at, at the popular um, campsites would grow into food supply, seed collecting. Now this was an interesting thing in parts of Australia. Ants would collect grass seeds, and um, Aboriginal and they would pile them outside their little holes, ready to take down. And um, Aboriginal people would scoop them up, and that was a way of a very efficient and, and effective way of, of harvesting. But people also harvested in much more sophisticated ways that in the in the um, southeast that I will talk about later. They maintained water holes. Aboriginal people maintained the water holes in the arid region, and that maintained the life of those areas. 
Um, and, and there were very sophisticated ways of trapping and poisoning fish. But one of the most important things of all is what's called fire stick farming. And it was a systematic burning that was maintained, that maintained the vast savanna grasslands all over the country. It's really quite a, quite a remarkable thing. And we don't do it, it's not done enough now. And, I, and when I went out bush in 1982 with these people and we got to places they hadn't been at for 20 years, they'd say to me, they'd get terribly upset. They said, it looks terrible, it hasn't been looked after and they'd be burning all the time. You know, first of all, I was you know, pretty terrified because I didn't understand the role of fire in that way at that time. But they, they said to me, no, it's okay, we know how to burn and fire goes uphill and they cleared and, they, they, and then of course what happens very quickly, fresh green shoots would come up. That would attract game. That was food supply. But it was also, it meant safety. They could walk without being scared of um, coming, coming across a snake, for example. So, you know, it, fire stick farming was very, very important. They had a huge knowledge of animal behaviour um, and animal distribution, of course and all animals were potential food sources and everything edible on a carcass was eaten. Muscle was very lean, and I'll show you some pictures of that, um, and you, you, you're probably all familiar with that anyway. Fat depots were usually small, but they were the favoured part of a, of, a, of a carcass. Organ meats were highly valued, a rich source of, uh, of again, omega-3 fatty acids, um, and um, also liver is a wonderful source of, 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 of many nutrients, which I'll be discussing as well. So small animals were baked whole, uh, like a little, little tortoise, freshwater turtle tortoise, um, and everything was eaten, all the juice and everything. Um, animals are wonderful at, uh, at uh, hunting and loved it, loved being photographed. Because uh, they were just so clever and so quick, it was just, I was astonished at it. And this, the woman on the right, you know, has a, a very dangerous snake, a king brown that she'd caught, and as they say, it's a five-minute snake. <laughs> if, it, if it really bites you, you don't last very long. And this doesn't, not a very nice photo, but it, this is a kangaroo that had been baked in a pit, and uh, and again, you know, everything was eaten um, uh, that was and and was shared around between people. Um, and this shows you very clearly the difference between our. Our, our meats, uh, most of our meats and wild meats, all wild meats are, are lean um, and they're all relatively rich in omega-3 polyunsaturates and domestic meats and, uh, are very different. And this shows again emu meat, really beautiful quality. So wild animals um, have no inter or intramuscular fat which, uh, and we have bred for that, for marbling. You know, we think it is a, is a high, high quality, you ask. You see the cooking shows and that's what they talk about. Um, and so no subcutaneous fat. The only fat depots were in the abdomen. And, um, and really the, the meat itself was, off, was just between 1% to 2% fat and it was in cell membranes mostly. So the ratio, as we've seen, of omega-3 to omega-6 was 1 to 2 in Western diets, it's up to 1 to 20. I think we're getting better in places like Australia. I think it's down to about 1 to 8, 1 to 10. Um, but, uh, a, a, and as I said, in wild animals, usually very little depot fat, but what was there was highly prized. Domesticated animals have been bred for fatness, as we know. I think Wagyu beef is something you know, that is an, an outrageous extreme, in my view. Um, and a low proportion of long-chain omega-3 fatty acids, high in saturated fat, and monogastric animals, and we are monogastric animals, as you know, but monogastric animals like the pig and the, and the chicken, their composition does reflect their food in the same way as ours reflects our food. Um, and so much of it is, is, is grain-based. So the, just to go back to what was valued um, in this diet, the most highly prized parts of a kangaroo, the, the hunter was the person who could distribute the kangaroo, and for good reason, it was such a, an amazing task to go hunting and often you know, be walking for, um, for uh, you know, 20 or 30 kilometres in a day. Um, so the hunter got the liver, the head and the shoulders. Now, I was fascinated at that because I would have thought the leg or you know, some of, but no, this is what they valued. 
and, um, uh, and, and, and the mesenteric fat. The, the liver is remarkably nu um, nutrient rich. I don't like the term superfood, but I think, I think in wild animals it is. Um, rich in vitamin C, folate. I mean, I was fascinated that people could last for months on end with very little plant food. And I was thinking, you know, there's no sign of scurvy. Um, and, uh, and really, it's eating, this, eating in the way that they did, particularly eating fresh, um, uh, fresh liver. Well, and everything was fresh. Um, but, but, so, but really, um, iron, folate, B group vitamins, long chain omega-3 fatty acids, as well as omega-6, but nice balance. And the brain, which the hunter also got, wonderful source of, of DHA um, and, and a soft food that was given to infants too, often, would be, um, and, and particularly if, if mothers died, the way they would save a child was if they couldn't get somebody else to, to breastfeed, which they usually could, they, would, they had special food that they would get for, for infants. And, of course, we are obsessed with cholesterol. I hope we're not still as obsessed as we were. But, um, but, but the, the success, most successful hunter in this study must have... I worked out he'd eaten probably in that six-week, seven-week period, he'd probably eaten 30 brains, kangaroo brains. You know, he'd eaten a huge amount of cholesterol, but his cholesterol didn't go up at all. And so I think these are some of the things that we need to understand. Um, and 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 we we um, we are obsessed in our society, I think, with meat rather than all of the components. Of, and most traditional cultures value all of the components of an animal, whatever is their major source of food. But it's got to be eaten fresh, and ideally, of course, free-range animals. So the composition reflects their diet. Now, I don't know if any of you you may have seen this slide before. It's one of my favourites. But this is looking at the composition of eggs from a Greek village and a US supermarket. So it's really the truly free range versus battery fed. And what I just want to point out is the huge difference here in the ratio of omega-3 to omega-6 fatty acids. So it's because what these animals are fed is what then their, their meat, that reflects the composition of, of, of their meat. This is the eggs, but the, but the muscle meat is the same. So plant foods, a wide um, variety of plant foods was consumed in season, tuberous roots, fruits, seeds, nuts, gums, nectar. Um, and relative to their, many of their cultivated foods, they're, um, they're very nutrient dense and they're, you know, they're high fibre but they're also very high in nutrients. Slowly digested carbohydrate, I mean the wild plum is one of the was people's favourite because it was very high in, in sorry, in, in vitamin, very high in, um, I'm a slow learner with this, this thing, uh, very, very high in vitamin C um, and people were wanting to just have, have that as a sort of health food but it was, wasn't a major food source, it was a food that people would eat sometimes when they could, when it was available. Um, slowly digested carbohydrate, very high in fibre, low in, of course, in sodium, high in potassium, magnesium and calcium, and a low, very low ratio or a healthy ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 fatty acids. So high nutrient but low energy density. Honey was the only energy dense carbohydrate source that people had and they absolutely loved it, but, but they had to work hard to get it and they had to share it. And so there really was, it was very different from, um, from the current situation. So contemporary diets favour insulin re resistance. Um, so, and it, particularly when you have poor dietary quality. Um, and one of the things that's uh, interesting, high intake of refined carbohydrate, fats and salt, and it's often saturated fat and salt, they're the stable forms of food that can, that can sit on shelves for a long time. Um, uh, low, often low protein intakes, and I think it really is very important that protein, sufficient protein, is really important um, so that people don't over overeat. And if we have very low protein in a lot of processed foods, that is a driver of overconsumption. Um, and as I say, this, this poor diet quality is amplified in remote parts of the country um, and uh, it's amplified by poverty in particular. 
but um, and it inevitably leads to um, early onset um, overweight and um, insulin resistance, diabetes in pregnancy, which has an impact on the next generation, and um, early onset uh, kidney failure and early, early onset cardiometabolic diseases. So this is uh, some work that I'm sure some of you would be familiar with from Julie Brimblecombe up in Darwin, looking at poverty in the food supply, the economics of food choice. It is a really important issue, as I don't need to tell an audience like this. Um, and uh, really the, the foods that people will live on when they don't have much, much money, uh, um, flour, sugar and tea would be the, the, the trio that people would have and making damper, you know, so making damper, that type of thing. People needed to be to be filled, but when but they loved their traditional foods, which were of course very high quality. So the the key nutrition issues in relation that insulin that linked to insulin resistance and the metabolic syndrome, high quality diets cost more. So really, is it poverty rather than genetics? People always want to look for a genetic explanation for things and uh, and I think that we've always that I always like to look for other explanations first high intakes of refined carbohydrate and saturated fat as I've said um, they are they are um, in products that will have a long shelf life very stable um, and uh, fatty meat is cheap takeaway foods uh, generally cheap as well and liquid calories another thing because liquid calories is completely foreign. I mean, I think it's pretty foreign to most of us, to most human populations until the last couple of thousand years. But, but in, in recent times, you know, that to actually the, the, the consumption of, of soft drinks in particular, but and alcohol beverages, it's so, so much watery liquid is perceived by the brain as water. So this is one of the problems, of course. About the low intakes of protein, and I am going to just... Um, to refer to, um, to, to some other, other work on this because I think it is really fascinating. And, and I don't think it's just low intakes of protein, I think it's um, the quality of the protein as well. And it is obviously of marked, in marked contrast to um, the traditional diet. So the protein, I don't, how many of you are aware of, you probably are in this audience again, aware of the protein leverage hy hypothesis? A lot of people I talk to aren't, but uh, it's, um, Yes, it's, it's a really important um, observation that um, Steve Simpson and David Raubenheimer, now at Sydney University, have done all of the work, starting from insects and moving right through to humans. We're all the same. We, um, we, can, we can regulate, um, or, or I, don't know, I think we're the worst regulators, but, um, but wild animals can regulate, depending on the season, whether they need more or less protein. So... He has, he has argued that, that protein is the key nutrient that drives energy intake. Diets high in, and rich in processed food are often low in protein because they're essentially carbohydrate and fat. Um, and so is this low protein um, consumption or in a diet driving overconsumption and um, ultimately the uh, uh, obesity epidemic. It's, it's consistent with the highest obesity levels in the lowest, in the most disadvantaged segments of the population. So I think it's a very important contribution to our understanding of, um, of, of some of our health problems. And, uh, and I do think we, we really need as a community, as society, to do something about it. Um, and, the, and I'm very, of course, of a, as I've said before, very worried about low-protein diets in remote communities. As low as 12% energy from protein in studies that Julie Brimblecombe has done and looking at the food supplies. It's very accurate work. Um, and often white bread is, the, high, is the, the source of the most protein in some people's diets, which is really appalling because it's, uh, you, we have to question the quality of it. Um, so I, I feel very strongly that we shouldn't just look at nutrients. We've really got to look at foods and diets so, because white bread in, in remote communities in the Northern Territory is fortified with a range of micronutrients. It's a major source of protein, as I've said, but also of fibre, poor quality. Um, it, it, it isn't the natural fibre from, from wheat flour. Iron, folate, cal um, potassium, magnesium, calcium, B-group vitamins and sodium, of course. 
And we can't assume that nutrients in this form are equivalent to when they're in their source foods. So looking at um, lean meat, fish, um, whole plant foods, for example. So our food supply, large uh, transnational food companies dominate it. Um, and economic and social s uh, systems favour availability and affordability of highly processed foods because they are the ones that are most profitable, they have the longest shelf life. And um, they're often fortified with popular nutrients, not necessarily in the amounts and, and uh, the types that we need. And as I said, high, highly profitable. So what, what, just to change tack really, how, how could we do it differently in Australia? How, how could we have done it differently? What can we learn from the remarkable land and water management practices of Aboriginal populations prior to white settlement? Dark Emu, Black Seeds, um, uh, it's a fantastic book by Bruce Pascoe, and then The Biggest Estate on Earth, How Aborigines Made Australia. Now that, by Bill Gamage, that is a book that... Um, really uh, people commented, the early settlers, you, there are so many examples of this now, of the early settlers saying it looks like a managed estate. Well, it didn't look like it for long after they got there. And that was because, and they were not recognising how well managed it was. It actually was a managed estate. So these are the books. Um, so the philosophy was looking after the land and the regular use of fire, as I've said, fire stick farming, as it's called, not just to encourage um, productivity and attract game, but to prevent wildfires. There were not huge wildfires in the past, and, and that it was because land was, was managed. So we should really look to recreate the managed estate that greeted early white settlers. Um, and we could learn from the traditional foods and sophisticated land management practices the use of fire, ambushing animals. I, I don't think that's going to take off, actually, as an agricultural <laughs> approach, but, but that's what was done. Because um, uh, I don't think we're going to be able to get over our fear of fire, but, but I think it would be good if we could learn, learn to use it a bit better. Uh, but it promotes the new growth and germination of certain trees, as many of you would know, certain, certain trees need fire to actually germinate seeds. It extended the, gra the vast um, savanna grasslands. And prevented destructive wildfires. So all of this was a very important land management approach. And when we look at, you know, agriculture, there's, there's debate. Is it agriculture or isn't it agriculture? I don't care what we call it. I think it was a form of agriculture. It was just didn't have fences. But it, but it was definitely a form of land management and it was linked to food and survival. So fish trapping on rivers, creeks and the coasts the coastal oysters and shellfish were very important. Eel farming in southwestern Victoria, it's absolutely fascinating the way that's been studied. Beautifully done and a long way from, from where the eels went um, to, to, to breed in, off the Queensland coast. Um, harvesting the grasses while they were green and this, um, you know, as well as maybe getting the ants to help you in some parts of remote Australia, the, 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 more, the more common method was to actually cut the grasses down when before the seeds had dispersed, then come back and collect them for bread making. Um, grinding stones have actually been found first, you know, 15,000 years old, and now up to 30,000 years old. So actually, people were processing food 30, up to 30,000 years ago in Australia, which is quite quite remarkable. And uh, there were methods for processing certain nuts and yams and, for example, cheeky yam, which I never actually tried, but I heard a lot about it. People didn't like cheeky lamb, yam unless they were pretty hungry. Um, so I, they never gave me it. We never had to have it. But that was to be soaked, chopped and soaked in water for two days, and then it could be cooked and eaten. Um, so there were just... Yeah, and, there, and it was no longer had the bitter flavours, which were recognised as poison. This is the Brewarina fish traps that still exist today. They're estimated to be at least 15,000 years old. It's fantastic. Um, and as I've said, grass seeds collected and processed all over Australia, pretty much all over Australia, certainly, certainly in, um, in, in the centre of the country for sure. Wild rice in Arnhem Land, which I haven't seen myself, but uh, Julie Brimblecombe tells me that people have told her about that, and we're both going to try and see if we can 
we can um, find some of it uh, in the next year or so. And then I, I was in, in Central Australia when I was collecting um, animal, uh, animal samples to analyse and looking at my composition of the hunter-gatherer diet all over the country. Um, we, we, the, the, in one community, rye bread was, um, w was mistakenly delivered instead of wholemeal bread. And in this particular community, in the APY lands, they had you know, a health system that was really trying to improve people's diets. So they, they knew people like white wheat bread, but they always ordered wholemeal as well. And people would buy the white bread, eat that, and then when nothing else was there, they'd eat the wholemeal. But when they tried the, um, the rye bread, they loved it. Reminded them of bush damper. But of course, it was never delivered again, um, even though that feedback was given. Uh, but but I think, and I think that is really interesting because because rye bread is made from essentially from grass seeds. Fish traps um, dating back to fifteen thousand years, as we've seen, and um, and the complex eel traps in southwestern Victoria. But they were eel traps that favoured the survival and a uh, you know, very productive survival of those populations. So um, Australians are becoming more open to eating wild foods and of course, but it's mostly the wealthier ones. The move has been largely driven by restaurants and innovative chefs. I mean, I'm sure many of you have eaten kangaroo, emu, crocodile in various places. And the plant foods, lemon, myrtle, finger limes, macadamia nuts are a major, major crop around the world now, but they come from Australia. Samphire, warrigal greens. Um, and it, it gives us, if we, we must learn from all of this because that gives us such important information about what thrives in Australia under, uh, and much of what we did doesn't thrive in Australia, what we introduced. It also gives us guidance on land and, and water management in remote parts of the country. There, there are some of the traditional foods, really lovely, from different parts of the country, a very small selection there. So, um, and others are looking to cultivate root vegetables um, in collaboration with Aboriginal groups, and particularly in um, Western Australia. They've found uh, 200 species that are, that are edible, of, of a kind of potato type food, and they've got two that are, are showing promise, which I'll show you in a moment, but there are many other possibilities that are being investigated now. So this is the yolk, an Australian bush potato. And there's yams that people are very familiar with, but, uh, but these are really very, very domesticatable, I gather. The um, kulyu is another bush potato which they're looking to cultivate. So what are the other possibilities locally? Many wild animals are eaten, well, all wild animals really eaten by Aboriginal people if they can get them. Game birds, goanna, snake, witchetty grubs, turtle, many other marine species, and introduced species that have gone wild, rabbits and, and hares, in fact, one, one of the things that fascinated me when I was collecting these samples, we, we caught rabbit, and uh, quite differently to cooking to the way they cooked wild animals, and I thought they would have just thought that rabbit was a wild animal, they put salt on it. And I said, well, why are you putting salt on it? And they said, white fella tucker. <laughs> and I thought, yes, that, that'd be right. Um, so, and uh, pussycat's very popular. Very popular. I've never tasted pussycat, but everybody loves it. Uh, and my God, they need to eat them because they are causing so much trouble. Um, wild deer, pigs, buffalo, camels. I mean, look at what we've done. You know, it's just extraordinary uh, in what, what, how we have really managed in an appalling way. But these animals have gone wild and they have, uh, they have become like other wild animals. They're lean. And, um, and they would be good for us to be, to be spending more time living on. So um, the foods that thrive in Australian conditions, in its stark contrast to many of the introduced species, plants and, and animals, of course, effective models of land management and using fire for land care. I think these are such important things. Low intensity, regular burns, specific to the particular environment. And that's, of course, what was done. It wasn't just done in a random way. Um, and, of course, as we know, as you, well, you all know, we spend a huge amount on people once they get sick. And um, we have so little focus in, in medical and health education generally on prevention. And I do think we've really got to, um, as a society, 
absolutely turn things around and try just sp spend much less money um, than we spend on treatment, on keeping people healthy. So this is what people look like even today when they live in remote Australia and um, hunt regularly. We should, we should learn from them. This was from Louise Maple Brown, gave me that slide very generously. So I've, I've got a lot of collaborators and a lot of funding agencies and uh, they've supported this work over many years and people in remote parts of the country, Aboriginal communities of course, but also health departments have been terrific as well. Thank, and, and I'll just finish on this slide, thank you.